The Canoe Show is brought to you in association with British Canoeing. Hello and welcome to the Canoe Show. I'm here in Cornwall having a go at the ultimate beach sport. No, 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 I mean surf ski. And I'm here in North Wales visiting a very special piece of water. But first, not everyone wants to take their holiday break on the beach. For many, it's the perfect opportunity to take on an expedition. So earlier this year, I went up to Scotland to check out one of three British coast to coast routes, the Great Glen Canoe Trail. This stunning 60 mile route passes through some of Britain's most jaw dropping landscapes with views of its highest peaks and expansive locks. The Great Glen Canoe Trail follows the Caledonian Canal from Fort William in the west through Fort Augustus at the tip of Loch Ness to Inverness on the east coast. Sadly on this trip I'm staying firmly on dry land but this does mean that I can better see how the route sits in the landscape. The view from where the canal starts at Corpac back to Fort William across Loch Linney makes for an inspiring sight. While Fort William itself is a perfect base for any expedition. Access at the entrance to the canal is easy and the early stages are sheltered, but it's not long until you reach your first challenge, a portage up Neptune's staircase at Banavi. Eight locks lift the canal up about 65 feet so taking a set of wheels is a very good idea. At the top, putting in again is easy, and then the long stretch to Gerlocky begins. For this section of the route, the Nevis range is ever present, and if you're lucky, there's views of Ben Nevis's infamous north face and the surrounding peaks. The canal gently snakes through the valley, surrounded on all sides by the most beautiful scenery. I just walked along the canal a little bit from where I hold up last night, I can't quite get my head around how beautiful this place is. So they surveyed the area as a whole and thought, what would be the most achingly beautiful landscape that we could build a canal in? <laughs> At Gerlocky, the canal joins with its first lock. And again, it feels as though everything about this junction has been designed to inspire. Loch Lochy may only be about a third of the length of Loch Ness, but for me, this is the jewel in the crown of the trail. It's a fairly long paddle at over nine miles, but you won't be thinking about the distance as you travel down this stunning fjord-like body of water. After a short stint on the next canal section, you reach Loch Oik, which is about half the length of Loch Lochy. There's not a lot to get excited about, but it's still a beautiful stretch of open water. And at the end, there's the historic Bridge of Oik over the river next to the canal, which makes a great backdrop for a rest. After another fairly long stretch of canal, we reach the outskirts of Fort Augustus and what is pretty much the halfway point. If you're planning a multi-day expedition as opposed to an endurance challenge, then a stop off at Fort Augustus is definitely a good move, because from here, it's straight out onto the most testing stretch of the route, Loch Ness. Yet again, the junction between canal and loch doesn't disappoint. But once you're past the canal mouth, it's just you, the loch and Nessie. Don't be fooled by these benign images of still waters. Loch Ness, when it's minded to, can be a beastie in its own right. With big swells and sea-like conditions out in the middle when the wind's up. So this section alone requires some experience and certainly a decent capability in a boat to be safe. Leaving the warnings aside though, this is a stunning piece of water. And if you're fortunate enough to have good weather like I did, it'll be a paddle to remember. Once through Loch Ness, the home stretch takes you back along the canal until you reach Inverness. 
the River Ness goes through Inverness itself, and it's well worth spending a little time there once you've completed the route. The canal, though, traverses around the edge of the city until it joins with the Bewley Firth, which is the end of the route. Of course, if you want to go from open sea to open sea, you'll have many more miles to travel, but the scenery alone will make up for that. This trail has been really well set up, and there's a great website with all the information you'll need to plan a trip. Of the three coast-to-coast -coast routes in the UK, this may be the shortest, but it's probably the one that gets you the closest to having a true wilderness adventure. There's something about beach sports that's just cool. The combination of sun, sea, sand really hits the spot. I've come to St Ives, the artistic capital of Cornwall, to meet Glen Eldridge of Ocean Sports Centre and to have my first taste of surf ski. So Glen, tell me a bit about surf ski. Started out in Australia. Uh, with the volunteer lifeguards, it was a way of going out and rescuing people and in fact it was a, it was a discipline, a race that you could compete in uh, and that eventually died out and the only country really still using surf skis are the South Africans, so they still, their lifeguards still rescue people on that. But what people don't realise is that as the sports developed, so have the skis. So now we've got a huge range of introductory skis for somebody who's gone out for the first time and all the way through to somebody who wants to maybe win a world title or a national title. Because it's highly skill laden, so you can get some really amazing paddlers, but te uh, technically amazing and really fit, go out in the sea, don't quite have the skills in slightly rougher water. Tell me what it is that is special about surf ski for you. What makes surf ski special is the environment. So this is my office, this is where I work, so it's not bad. Then we get to go out on the sea and that is ever changing, you know, and, and for me personally, you know, I like getting bashed out in the water as much as I like paddling in the sunshine. You know, anything kind of involved around the ocean is perhaps a little bit more relaxed, shall we say. So it just makes it maybe a little more friendly. And, and so there's probably a lot of paddlers coming across a little bit later in life who have those, the family and it's a lot easier to convince a family to come to the beach than it is uh, either a, a river or a ditch in the middle of the country somewhere. So I'm just going to have a go. Um, tell me a little bit about what I need to be thinking about and what I'm going to experience. We've got pretty placid conditions so we can just uh, bob along, we're not going to have to worry about balance. But I'm going to challenge you a little bit, I'm going to push you and put you in the elite ski uh, and give you uh, a little challenge in your ability to stay upright. Thanks for that, Glenn. OK, so once you fitted me out in the wider and more stable beginner's ski, I faced my first real test, actually picking the ski up. Ah! Sand in my face. Oh, there, there you go. Do I look a pro? You got it. Into the wind. Into the wind. I think we might need to speed this bit up, if you don't mind. Bye! Right, ready for the off. The great thing about surf ski is that you have foot pedals which operate a rudder, so steering and tracking in a straight line is a piece of cake. Glenn came out to keep an eye on me, but he needn't have bothered, as this first ski was just a dreamed paddle. It was stable, cut through the water, and I really felt that it would be a safe boat in rougher conditions. Then it was time for the elite ocean ski which looked about half the width of the last boat. It was more stable than a flat water racing kayak, but not by much. Right from the first paddle straight though, I knew I'd win the bet with Glenn and wasn't going to swim. But I wouldn't say I was feeling stable. This is the F1 of racing skis and needs respect if you want to stay dry. It also needs a fair amount of getting used to, but the Coast Guard helicopter wasn't going to be needed on this occasion. It was lighter, sleeker and faster through the water and after a little while I really began to feel the boat's potential. I thoroughly enjoyed my introduction to surf ski and will certainly be back for more. If you love the beach life and you want something a bit more racy than a paddleboard or a sit on top, then an ocean ski could very well be the boat for you. Well, you know what they say, where there's a swell, there's a way. Or should that be a ski?
This is the River Dee at Trevor, and this stretch of the river has a secret that needs to be shared. And that's because it's the birthplace of competitive canoe slalom in the UK. In 1939, Franz Schillioff organised the first ever canoe slalom competition in Britain. And thankfully, because he was also instrumental in setting up the British Canoeing Film Library, we still have the footage from that historic day. You might notice a few differences from present day canoe slalom competitions, with bare chested paddlers and huge unwieldy craft. But the essence of canoe slalom is all there. There's no question that the river has changed over the years and it's probably unrecognisable from what it was then. In fact, it's hard to find anybody locally who actually thinks of this place as Trevor Rocks. To them, Trevor Rocks is a place on a hillside above a pub. It's also really difficult to find reference material giving a precise location of the event. The chalkboard map in the footage clearly shows three channels, but at the only whitewater section of the river at Trevor, there's only a single channel, although in the past there was a mill stream on the left under the balcony. And the fallen trees suggest other landmass in the stream at some point. This stretch of the river is known to canoeists as Trevor Rocks though, which further suggests a connection, but it's hard to be definitive. When you look back at the archive footage though, it doesn't really matter where exactly on this stretch of the River Dee those intrepid paddlers first ran the rapids in competition. With the Canoe Slalom World Championships taking place in London this year, it's just fascinating to look back in time and see how far Canoe Slalom in the UK has come since then. Our trail this time is short and sweet. It's a quick scoot round St Michael's Mount in Penzance. What this trail lacks in length, it more than makes up for in impact on the water. The route sets off from the beach next to Marazon Marsh car park and you make a beeline across to the harbour mouth on the island. You have to avoid the band of rock that lies directly across your path, choosing the route to suit the tide level. Once at the harbour mouth, you get a great view of the village, with a castle on the hill above. From the harbour, I follow the large wall along the western edge where the castle looms large above you. I had to just keep stopping and staring up at this remarkable building. But it's such a short route that it would have been a shame to rush it. From here, it was simply a question of paddling around the island, taking care not to get too close because of the rocks that sit just off the edge. Around the back was the most exposed part on this day and care is advised that the sea state is rough or the wind is strong. But the castle gardens were a nice distraction. Soon enough though, I was surfing my way back towards the harbour and a unique view of people apparently walking on water. This is obviously a tidal route, but it's doable at low water. You just have to portage across the causeway to complete the loop. Once across the causeway, it was just a case of heading back to the beach and one last view of this iconic island. If you fancy going a bit further afield for your paddling trip, a must-visit destination is Croatia's Adriatic coast.
There's no escaping the fact that sit on tops and inflatable kayaks have revolutionised this sport. They've got thousands of people out on the water who otherwise wouldn't have gone canoeing. So here's Glenn Eldridge again of Ocean Sports Centre with his top tips for staying safe on sit on tops and inflatables. The growth of sit on top kayaks, whether they're plastic, rotor moulded or inflatable boats, has, has been exponential over the last few years. In terms of uh, getting out on the water, it's really important to firstly understand that it's a dynamic environment. Things just can't be switched on or off. Get the weather report. Know what the tide is doing. So whenever you go paddling, it's always important to go into the wind or the tide first. When if you get tired, you've just got to come back with the wind. The worst case scenario is you might sit there with your paddles out of the water, but you're going to get blown back to the point you came from. So it's important to understand your local environment. And if you don't know, ask the lifeguards. Ask somebody who knows. Don't be afraid to go to the harbour master and talk to them or the lifeguards on the beach. Let somebody know where you're going to and let them know what sort of time you're going to be back, but also have a threshold. So this is acceptable. If I'm this late, this is okay. But once it gets past this time, you need to call these people. And that's really very important to, to do that. The next one is the kind of kit that you take out in the water. So you don't need a great deal, but it's absolutely vital that you wear a buoyancy aid. Uh, that buoyancy aid means that if you can't get back into your craft, you can fall out. But if you can't get back in, you know that you're going to be okay. But what's also really important in the most of the situations is always to stay with your craft much easier to find somebody with a big lump of plastic than it is that person on their own. Uh, and But it's good practice to have uh, a phone of some kind uh, in a walkproof pouch. So then you know that if there is an issue, you can call somebody. The advantage of these type of craft is that it holds weight, it goes in your boot. If you don't have a garage to put them in, then it will go in, in, in nice and neatly underneath the stairs at home somewhere. The disadvantage of these types of craft usually is that they have a, a higher freeboard or a gunnel on them, so they sit higher on top of the water. What that means is on a windier day, because they're lighter and they have this higher windage or greater windage than a normal kayak, means they're going to be influenced by the local conditions more so. But also as the conditions maybe get a little bit rougher, they don't quite have the same rigidity and have a little bit like a lilo effect as you're going through the water. Knowing your environment is really important. And there's a particular type of wind that isn't going to work so well with an inflatable or anything that goes out on the water, and that's known as an offshore wind. The problem with the offshore is that you're heading out to sea, feeling relaxed, this is lovely, feeling much warmer, but then when you turn around, you're confronted by this offshore that's blowing straight out to sea. So whenever in doubt, don't go out and try and find somewhere else that might be more suitable. Uh, maybe a local lake or river or an estuary. It might just mean that later on in the day it might be better for you to go out in the water. Well, that's it from this special holidays edition of the Canoe Show. Next time we're at the ICF Canoe Slalom World Championships in London. So we'll see you there. Goodbye. Goodbye. If you'd like to be at the ICF Canoe Slalom World Championships in London, to watch the world's best battle it out on the London Olympic course, then here's the schedule. And you can get ticket information from the official Canoe London website at the bottom of the screen. Show is brought to you in association with British Canoeing.